So, are you ready for this? Yes. I suppose. Yes. So, first of all, good afternoon and thank you for coming and joining us. Um, as some of you know, we were, I think you know, we were traveling for doing four months around West Africa. Um, now and we are back and we are bringing back some of the things that we have learned. And every week we are doing different products. And this week we are talking specifically about politics and we decided to invite sort of some people to discuss with us. So it's not just alone, us alone and our opinion. And the topic is uh, human rights. Um, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, the, it's like we want to talk not only about human rights itself, but also about privilege a bit to touch both topics and try to compare them. Is it the same thing or not? Because through our travel, we witness and we experience some things that we found relevant to talk about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What was the second topic? I'm sorry. Privilege. Human privilege. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Human rights and privilege. Like, okay. are we doing both the same or is it something different? Or, like, we got it. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So, we're going to start like introducing ourselves and maybe as you that are our, you are our guest. So, maybe you should start, one of you. Um, okay, well, first of all, um, sorry for my English. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm very fluent, fluent, but I will try and you can edit my terrible mistakes. Uh, my name is Carlos. I'm 25 years old. Um, I'm from Madrid, in Spain. I studied uh, political sciences uh, and I'm currently um, working on, on my PhD. And uh, and working on a sociological institution, the Center of Sociological Investigations in Spain, oh. and that's it. And it sounds better than it really is because I'm actually making a poor job in my <laughs> PhD and poor job in the in the sociological institution. But okay, <laughs> that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thanks for the invitation. I'm also really happy to see you again online. Um, so my name is Michelle George. I'm currently sitting in Germany for like the last four or five weeks. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> and my, I have a psychological background. I'm currently um, self-employed, so I have my own startup where we focus on defining the purpose that each of us has, how to achieve it, and thereby unlocking human potential for a better tomorrow. So having a social impact is the, the big objective behind everything, to make it very short. <laughs> Rubik's potential, but uh, subscribe on uh, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> My name is Sergei, and uh, I'm 22 years old, from Latvia. And currently I'm studying in Denmark in the NS Necessary Teacher Training College. <laughs> so I am Delia from Spain. Uh, I fin I'm 23 and I finish industrial design in Spain. And I'm here also studying with Sergey, BNS, BNS, the Necessary Teacher Training College. And we are here teaching pedagogy so, to be future teachers. So we can start with the questions. And I think, yeah, we can start with the first one. So uh, what are human rights? Uh, yeah, Michelle. Oh, I, I, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I, I actually I would like to hear from you first. What does human rights mean for you? Because as I know, this rabbit's potential is working with opening like human potential, and I think you working with people have some consideration for that topic. Yeah. Well, for me, it's when you ask the question that way, it's already difficult to completely split it from human privilege and rights. Um, I mean, it happens that I did my master thesis also on speciesism, 
basically everything that has to do with animals and their rights. And I would like to stop there, I guess, because we humans are great in ignoring rights that everyone has also implemented by nature. So for example, we have dogs and cats and we pet them and we treat them like little babies. We put them clothing on and make them very cute, which basically is not what they're supposed to live through or experience, right? Because they still, at least they started as wild animals and they have other needs than we do. And I think if we're looking in nature, everyone normally is able to receive and fulfill or satisfy their needs in one way or another. But then when we evolved as humans, we started to change this, right? Because now it's not possible any month for everyone to satisfy their basic needs. And I mean, the very basic needs are one of safety, food and shelter. And we have so many people that actually, well, they are far, far, far away from it. So and in that case, saying human rights comes to the very political part. Um, and I have some issues with politics, basically because it's very often just a label and the change is not happening as fast as I think it could be. Uh, so the people that suffer most from it are again, probably people you also met during your travels and also people I met during my travels. Um, and they very much, sometimes they don't even know what human rights are because they don't profit from it. And then we get back again to the human privileges, uh, which, well, let's get to that topic later. I hope we answered your question in some way. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's my turn, I guess. Uh, what is human rights? So I will say, um, Human right there, it's um, a set of basic elements that every human being should have and that have the symbolical form of a law. It, it seems like a law, but they don't have any law enforcement behind it. I mean, every human being has the right to health care, but not every human being has health care. Or there is not a law enforcement for making every human being, um, for giving every human being access to, to health care. Um, so I think that could be an, an interesting point. What, uh, what's the, what's the use of, of of human rights if there is no law enforcement? If if there is any um, symbolic or any, well, maybe Dalia could translate some words in Spanish if I know. Um, but um, is there in any sense on the on the simple fact of um, put on a paper um, the human rights? Or, or, is this, or is it useless? And I think that could be an, another interesting point of, of the discussion. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying um, because I think having just this human rights as a law gives some people an idea what they're also actually fighting for. Mm -hmm. So yes, politics is the one part, but then we have the movement from the, let's say the big audience, the public, the people. Mm -hmm. And I guess these are also inspired by human rights because now we know what it is, what it should like, and also what hmm. to do in places where they are not there yet or not offered hmm. and protected. Hmm. I, I basically agree with you. And I think that's the, the reason why we call human rights natural rights. rights. I mean, it, this is a, a political construction to, to say natural rights because there are no natural rights as, uh, unless you are a, a religion people and, and you think God give you the, this right. There is no um, natural thing behind the, this right. There is a, it's a political um, struggle to, to win them. So I think, yeah, that there is a symbolic force on, on looking at them and say, okay, this is the, the set of things that there is, we should um, fight for, we should um, take. I'm curious, what have you discovered on your travels? Also, uh, to... I didn't travel that very much. In fact, I basically stayed in, in, Spain, in Spain and um, similar countries, like mm -hmm. Andorra or Belgium. Yeah, in our travel, um, 
like I cannot say that we witness human rights in its power, but more like violations of these human rights, which uh, made us a big question about what is that and uh, like from where it comes and how it should be basically. And uh, so far I kind of, yeah, there is this uh, natural human rights, um, but uh, they are not really like, as far as I noticed, they're not really like everywhere for everyone. And I think here it comes this maybe civilian rights, like, hmm. yeah, civilian rights and natural, natural rights. Like for, for me, it's kind of two different things because civilian rights protect like rights of the concrete place, concrete people. But when natural rights, they are spread to, to all people doesn't matter from their background or social status or race or something like yeah. uh, I don't know I, what I found really interesting that uh, so maybe not that much in the travel but when I was preparing for this is this idea of this beautiful paper of uh, these 30 articles of human rights that are you read them and you say okay they are really powerful and they have a lot of power <laughs> yeah. But then you see that many countries have uh, signed it, and then there is not law behind. It's just kind of an idea of we sign this, but then nothing is behind it, like really constructing or really building it that much. This ideal world of, you know, how to. Thank you. I found it really interesting. And what kind of violation of human rights have you uh, foreseen, not, not foreseen, seen in your um, in your trips? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I'm the interviewer now. <laughs> yeah. in, uh, Mauritania. Uh, we met one uh, activist. Uh, like he's writing a lot of articles, and he is kind of part of that uh, of these um, different movements, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we were making investigations, investigation about politics with my uh, teammate, with Barbala, and uh, he told us about one guy that was sentenced to death for his uh, like constructive critics about politics in Mauritania and the way how government was working. Or also in Morocco, we were making investigations about uh, culture, and we found out about Amazir culture there. And we managed to talk with a few people from Royal Institute of Amazigh Culture. And uh, there we get to know more about the history of culture, how it was oppressed, marginalized in a sense, uh, where culture itself like, was almost like, disappeared just because they, were, they didn't have rights to speak their language. They were judged for that on the public, they were not able to speak between each other and their language. They had to speak Arabic or French, mm -hmm. which is uh, considered as official languages of, um, of Morocco. But in reality, these people were living in this territory called Maghrib, Maghreb, before. Before Arabs and French came. Mm -hmm. like, and now their language is basically like, mm -hmm. just starting its mm -hmm. path. It's just started to be implemented in schools as a teaching language. Uh, they started only like since this democratic spring from 2011 mm -hmm. called like that everybody knows as Arab Spring. Like from that some changes started to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, now they have these uh, names of official places uh, in three languages, in French, in Arabic and uh, in Berber. Like, mm -hmm. But it's also a sign that human rights are like building up, like at some point will prevail, at least in this country. I think one of the most clear examples is the freedom of movement and how me with a European passport, I can move all around Africa without, the, I don't know, for around, but where we were with not many problems. Just okay, we pay the visa, but we just wait a couple of hours and we have the visa. And then 
people cannot move from there, they are waiting for long times, they cannot even afford it because it's much more expensive or the things. I think one is one of the most clear examples. Mm -hmm. That could be one example of one human right that ha that we lose it um, in our modern world, maybe. Because I mean, freedom of movement was something I think uh, mostly guaranteed on um, centuries ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how do you think? What can justify violations of human rights? Oh, now we're going to get uh, ethical <laughs> and moral. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, you know, like what they say, my freedom ends at the point where your freedom starts. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's like this tricky question. Like if you could save your mom or your brother, who would you save? Right. Or if you say, yes, I need to kill one person in order to save a million. Like, is that justified? Uh, it depends from the intention. For example, uh, if we'll take example of potential threat to people by one person, and if you'll limit his movement, take like right of free movement, like would, will it be justified? As uh, like, I limit his uh, rights, I took one of his rights, freedom of movement, and for uh, benefit of the majority. So I think this is a very tricky question because I believe many of the great people that actually caused a lot of pain in the world and history, they had in their mind definitely a good intention for some people. So I guess what, what's missing is a philosophical person that we would need here. Um, but Carlos, what do you think on this topic? Um, I think, okay, on, on the paper, uh, a greater defense of, of human rights could justify some violations. I'm thinking on a, on a simple example. In, in Spain, we have currently a, a massive violation of rights, of right of mobility, because we are in quarantine. Uh, we are in quarantine for, in fact, defending the uh, a greater human right, that is the, the right to, to live, and um, put an end to the, to the spread of, coronavi of coronavirus, etc., etc., et So, again, yeah, in, in law, there are moments that human rights can be violated. But it is true that this kind of philosophy opens the door to, to, to a certain abuse, um, to a certain, okay, yeah, I'm sure these, these um, political opponent um, has, um, it's a threat to our community, so we should incarcerate him, etc. So I, I think it's a complex debate in, in that point. And yeah, we could accept some punctual um, violations of, of human rights in very specific situations, but I think in general, um, we should respect um, the human rights in I also think I agree with what you say um, also with the current situation and I guess it's a good example like how when you take like a small violation and we accept it in order to avoid bigger ones mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also one part of another situation in this case at least we have an explanation we have a reason that everyone agrees on um, yeah, but look, in, sorry, uh, in this yeah. case, people agree on that. Yes. So it, mm. it's kind of, it's their choice. Of, uh, Not everybody choice. I mean, yeah. there is a movement in the United States against the, the, the quarantine and, and demonstrations on the, on the parliaments for reopening the, the states. Definitely. I mean, I also see it in Luxembourg and Germany, um, especially the entrepreneurs, independent workers. Mm. They're all kind of losing clients, they're losing money, they're losing jobs, but they have still bills to pay. And of course, they would love to reopen, but then they would need to pay a fine, which they also don't have the money for. Um, so yeah, in that case, it is already a serious, for them at least, a serious violation. So actually, I'm not, I'm not sure. And I think for me, to be completely able 
to tell you or give you an honest answer, I would need to be in this specific situation myself. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. yeah. But is this situation affecting somehow your entrepreneurship? Uh, my entrepreneurship, if I violate other people's rights? No, 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 no. The situation <laughs> with coronavirus. Like, is it affecting your job? Is it affecting your initiatives? Yes, definitely. I mean, I'm lucky. I can do a lot of things online. And I use my time in order to re-strategize and focus on the things that I can do at the moment. Um, but yeah, I was supposed to have different new projects going on with new clients, which of course, just like moments before we kind of signed the contract, this whole thing happened. And um, now we're staying in touch and checking every now and then to see how can we proceed. Um, and I'm lucky that I don't have a shop and a rent to pay because I know other people have thousands of euros they need to pay each month. And if I would have that, I would be like, after the first month, after the first few weeks, I would have been gone with my business. So as a startup, let's say I'm lucky, but I do understand the pain and the fear of all the other people out there and also the challenges they face. And I mean, if you look at it, it's like one entrepreneur, for example, in um, everything that has to do with restorations, like gastronomy. Mm -hmm. So it might be one restaurant, but there might be 10 people working there. And these 10 people have a family, each of four. So it's not just one person. It's in total, there are 40 people depending on this one business. So there's always like a lot more behind it that not everyone is seeing. And that makes it, I guess, very tricky. But how is it for you? I mean, you're mostly still studying or preparing to graduate also with the PhD. So what about your right of freedom? Well, it doesn't affect me a lot. In fact, I, I continue working um, from home and without much problems. And I continue making, or not making, my PhD from home. So, so for me, it's not really, really a problem. And I think it is right that for some people that that's been in fact catastrophic and i think there will be a job for the for the state to for for the government to i mean um if this if we all stay home and we all have to stay home just to stop the, the spreading of the of the pandemic and, and for the greater goods to of course saying it somehow we have a, a, a structure and uh, the, the state just to redistribute the resources and to make sure that everybody can make it. And I think that's the, that's the role. Yeah. I think this is also a great example, this current extreme situation, um, how it connects human rights and, and the, the privileges, right? Because when we're saying, yes, they cut our human rights in order for us to stay safe and home and healthy. And then there are so many people out there who cannot keep this distance and makes it even yeah. worse staying at home. So for them, that's the complete opposite. And then there's the topic of the privilege that comes in. Yeah, then there has been a constant um, saying in Spain that uh, the coronavirus equalizes us all, the coronavirus goes for rich and for the poor. And it's not right. It's obviously not right. I mean, poor people um, have... Um, can't keep the, the same distance in their homes because they, there are maybe six people in a, in a little home. Poor people have to work or are losing their jobs mm, and rich people tend to, to be able to work from home. I mean, there is a class and normal class difference and there are two gender difference, race, race difference, etc. So coronavirus has a political um, mm, different impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I had an example from Russia where you can see this uh, like great example of how for somebody it's okay and for how for somebody it can be really a disaster. And now in Russia, there is a, they have a hashtag kind of uh, pay my kids for food and I will stay at home. Uh, mm. And the reason of that is that some people are forced, to, not forced, but they have to go to the job. 
like to provide food for their families. Otherwise, they cannot just sit, sit at home. They have to go out every day from their home to feed their family. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like, like who will? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an example, like for what you said. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'm, you can also see it in the charts. Um, I'm not sure if you've followed the statistics, but basically, for example, the death rate is a less lower in Germany because we have a lot better medical uh, support. Mm-hmm. And then you have other countries where this is not given. It's just having a look, for example, in the United States, um, mm-hmm. so many people also not having really health insurance. And I guess also they are not at the moment not prepared for this big number of people Mm -hmm. rushing into the emergencies and hospitals Um, and we can see the consequences Mm -hmm. even though you would say that the United States are also a country of privileged people. Mm -hmm. It's a country of great inequalities, I mean enormous inequalities and I think the the death rate is much um, important, more important in Afro-American populations in in the United States, with with important difference, just because of, of what you say. Yeah, maybe then we can move a bit to further discussions and about awareness of people of their human rights and uh, yeah. And uh, is it actually relevant to talk about them? What do you think? Carlos, do you want to start or should I? Okay, I, uh, yes, I, I think it's, it's totally relevant, first of all, because we still have an, an enormous amount of violations of, of human rights. Um, and, and secondly, and on the other hand, because they think it has a, a specific power, specific uh, symbolical power to say, I'm not just fighting for healthcare, I'm fighting for the human right of healthcare or something I should have. And so you don't have to, to discuss about if everybody in this land should have access or to healthcare or not, because we, we already did it, we already um, decided that everybody has it in this right, so we are just talking about yeah about law enforcement in, in some way i mean i think um we could talk about human like rights as um, a matter of, of law enforcement when if this uh if there is a robbery in in my street i can go to the police and the police should um, investigate should, should make the research should, should uh, put an end to, to the situation because there has been a, a violation of the law but if I see uh, a family who's, who has not uh, a decent house or, or, an, or a decent access to, to education, uh, and there are obviously thousands and thousands on Spain, I can go to the police and say, okay, fix it. Because there is no um, something that is in the law, but in the more abstract human rights. Maybe we should talk about, think about human rights as something about law enforcement. Maybe I should go to the police and say, hey, some people there has not um, access to 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 the, to the education system, and there is an inequality. There is a, a violation of, of human rights, and and maybe the government should do um, something to fix the situation immediately. So yeah, I think it could be a, a change of paradigm. I'm not sure if. <laughs> I think to what you say with law enforcement, some some of the rights are already enforced, right? So kidnapping is not allowed. Are hurting other people is not allowed then at the same time i mean there's so stupid things like gun rights like everyone can have a gun if as long as it's registered you know don't need to have a psychological testimonial or assessment saying that you're sane enough to carry a gun um yeah so the law is not always maybe the best to point out i think um but what I to just come back also to Sergey's question, <laughs> if we should talk about it or not, and if it's relevant. I think a lot of people, it's like when you're healthy. When you're healthy, you don't care. Mm-hmm. But when you're having a cold, it bothers you a lot. And I guess same goes for the human mm-hmm. rights. As long as we're comfortable, we don't even realize that we have them. We don't appreciate them. 
And as long as we don't see them, like see violations, we can't be bothered. Um, it's like I was traveling just before this whole thing happened, I was traveling into Vietnam. And when I came back, I appreciated so many more things and I was aware of everything we have and all the human rights also. So basically I have access to, to a good health system, right? No matter where I'm positioned in society in Luxembourg. And I have a shelter, I have a warm place to stay, I have safety. Uh, I'm free to, to do whatever I want to do. I don't need to wear a scarf on my head to cover my hair or cover my face. Um, I can clearly say that I don't have a religion or I have three and nobody cares. And of course I don't do this because also it's not relevant for me at the moment. But if someone would tell me you have to do this or be that, then it would change in an instant. Yeah. I want to add something because we were at this question was kind of answering that maybe, yeah, there are many violations and we should talk about it. But even if there will not be violations that all human rights will be covered. We should still, still talk about it because it's important to talk about what we have to realize how how also how much it costs to have it, and also there are human rights that we we all have. Maybe we need to realize the cost of them and to be sure we don't love them in some ways. We appreciate them. We appreciate the people that had fight for having them. I think it needs to maybe have like a refreshed branding mm -hmm. you know like when there was this phase where a lot of people changed to uh, veganism mm -hmm. and they had hipsters and you would say like ah oh, please don't and i have a feeling like human rights at the moment is like a similar topic like people are bored at it and just fed over and it would need to come with a new whole new package mm -hmm. that people would get excited about it again and have this wake-up call I guess it would make a big difference already. You know, there are two great movies or series um, that are connected in different ways to human rights. And one is very popular, it comes from Spain, you probably know it. It's The Money Haste, mm -hmm. where they wear the red overalls and have the Dali masks. Oh, yeah, 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 like a cyber belt, yeah. Yes, so I think that's one good example, like what they do, they violate human rights in order to fight for their own rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I just saw some chapters, but their own right, uh, they, their own right was to have uh, uh, millions of, of euros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was not only that, it was also more like, it is a revelation against the system that's not working for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, but, did their um, revelation work for everyone or for them? I mean, I mean if you have, I, I can't say anything in case people are watching this and I don't want to spoil her, um, but you definitely should watch the end and make your own opinion. Yeah, probably. I mean, what, what the series is doing, not just the series in, on television, right? But before this whole lockdown was, there were, videos from people when they could still move around they were actually in real life wearing these red suits and having the dali masks fighting for their rights so this is i think a great example of what's behind there's also a short document on netflix um, that's connected to this and it gives you also perspective on the spark that they put there and it happened they use it really as a symbol people out there use it as a symbol to protest and to fight for their personal rights. And I think this is very, very strong symbol. And what I said about the new package, this is how they did it. And they didn't even have the intention, but it was what people needed and what they wanted. I think it's a little bit dangerous to say, like Casa de Papel, this, I don't know the name in English of the say. <laughs> because they violate the human rights in a really clear way to reach their rights or to reach what they think they deserve or they want. They clearly violate the right of all the people that they have there close in the building to, how do you say, 
to work on the creation of money. yeah to work and then they have them as a um, sequestrar yeah kidnap it yeah they just kidnap them and they have them so it's kind of yeah Yes, uh, wait, I think the word we're looking for is a hostage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they take them hostages. And I completely agree. Um, and I think, especially in the first part, I was very impressed how, because the professor who's behind everything, this big mind, right? How much he's planning everything through in order that no one gets injured while they're doing all this. So of course, there's a lot of things going wrong. Also showing that, yes, you can have this idealistic view, but then of course, being a criminal, of course, it's not the way to go and there's no way that nobody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. But that's what, Sergey, I think you also said in the beginning, the intention behind it was good. And they did everything they could in order to prevent that somebody would get hurt. Mm -hmm. right? That was their idealistic dream behind it. Then, of course, it, it goes different. Um, but really impressed by the power impact it had on the real world. Um, mm -hmm. Going to the second series, maybe you've heard of it too. It's again, it has to do with the red dress this time. It's called The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. Do you know it, Carlos? Um, I have heard of it, but I didn't uh, look at it, watch it. Okay, that's a real extreme situation of changing or violating human rights oh, and okay. saying it's for the greater good okay. because it's it plays in the United States mm -hmm. um, and basically people are not fertile anymore, so we don't reproduce anymore. So this is the greatest resource we have, basically fertile women. And to women that actually go against the law, and there we go back against human rights. For example, it's not allowed to be homosexual. That's against the law. So you get punished by becoming this machine to give birth to kids. Not your own kids. It goes more into violations of your complete freedom. You're not allowed to do anything. Everything is completely strict. So you have to act like this. You have to sleep with the person they assign you to while the wife is watching so there are always three people at least and it's it's really it's crucial it's like it's cruel it's awful at the same time it's fascinating to see what people are capable of because i think if something goes wrong at some point could it all end up there and also having the understanding that yes, what's happening there is really bad, but then there are people out there at the moment in our reality who experience far worse. Mm -hmm. So I think this is all a really great inspiration, um, but very well. You need to have a strong stomach sometimes to take it. <laughs> and it has been a, a symbol for the feminist movement in Atlas in Spain. Oh. The, this series? Yeah, yeah, the husband, husband tale, right? Yes, yes. Husband tale, yeah. Uh, Mercuntra Criada, we say in Spanish, I think. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, huh? Yeah, I, I think this is also, again, very impressive to see. Um, again, what, because only we, and now getting back again to privilege, only we as a privileged crowd have access to this kind of series. And I think that's a great part that we use it as an inspiration to bring it back to real life and also support people who are not yet. Hmm. So if we go back to this, uh, what is for you a privilege? What do you consider as a privilege? And uh, if I would define it, I will say that it's more an advantage. Like it's very maybe relative uh, thing, like mm -hmm. which you can see only in comparison. Like if you'll see like 
me and like somebody else like who don't have something i will be privileged because i have something more like mm -hmm. i have this privilege of ha having something maybe but without my uh, it was just given to me as it is like i didn't do anything for that i didn't achieve it i didn't reach it kind of i didn't do something to get it mm -hmm. in this way of advantage it's kind of if we'll imagine this starting line i'll be so this runner who will be closer to the finish basically like, Are you refer to this video where people stand at the line and they get asked questions yeah, like yeah, if yeah. you never had to care about where to sleep take a step forward yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and i think maybe well before i go into that i want to hear carlos opinion too uh okay the, the definition of, of privilege if i should make a definition i would say um a benefit a comparative benefit that you have and another people don't have and that you shouldn't have i mean there may be comparative benefits when some people don't have what they should have um, don't have for example um, human rights access to healthcare etc but i would not call this a, a privilege um, i would look it at the at the other side and call it a, a violation of, of human rights more than a privilege so um Okay, that was a, a difficult question for when when Delia sent me some some of the questions. Um, I like to to think about the world. I think um, we should have right now or in 20, 14 years, and how each each one of us um, and not just humans, uh, animals, etc., should live in in this world. And what uh, each human being should have it for for granted and what could be could be optional so and i think for example in 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 my world every human being should have access to healthcare should have a, should have access to, to education shelter food etc but i don't think every human being um should have access to a, a 20 million bank account in in switzerland or um 10 different houses for or for renting so the 10 different houses for renting are a privilege um, for me, and that's things that you should not have because the fact that you have it, it's what makes a, a comparative advantage towards other. That is what I call a, a privilege. But the basic rights that everyone should have, as the sent um, house, as a decent house, etc. I'm resisting to call it a privilege, even if it is a comparative advantage, and this is clear. Yes. I think in the beginning we were all kind of even and then years ago it started to shift when we took away resources in Africa and also other places. Um, it goes way too far back so let's stay here. Uh, yeah, competitive advantage definitely. And I think it's something a lot of people never realize. Uh, what kind of luxury they live in and what privileges they have. For example, in Luxembourg, many people complain. And there are youngsters that, well, they are in very difficult situations. They have nearly no support of family. If the family is still there, they might not have a job. They might not have a good education, even though they have access to it. But then the system, the education system is not made for them, right? Because some people learn different than others. Um, again, another topic. So they just sit there and they complain all the day long and don't see what they actually could achieve with what is there on resources. Um, Sergei, we went together two years, oh, it's already two years ago. We were in Georgia, right? And then, so when I came back, I was, so aware of everything I have, which also is one of the reasons why I actually founded my company and why it has the name Rubik's Potential. Because I do believe we all have a unique potential, but not everyone has all the resources available to make the best out of it. So in case you have your unique potential and the privilege, well, for me, you also have a responsibility. I know in German, there's this one saying, um, 
I'm not sure if it goes the same in English. Maybe we need to look it up. <laughs> if you have great responsibility or great power, you have great responsibility. Something like that, I guess. It was from Spiderman. <laughs> Right? See, and I so love the movies. <laughs> a great power I'll... comes with a great responsibility. That's what uh, Uncle Ben said. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a freaky uh, chicken. <laughs> no, I love that because, I mean, there's so many things. Right. The best movies and series are inspired by all these topics. I have another one. Um, not sure if you know this one. It's 3%. And there, do you know it? You look like uh, you know it. I think yes, it's something like the three percent of the world suddenly disappear or something like that. No, not no. Not okay, that, a totally different <laughs> thing. So, yes. Yes. So uh, basically, right? They try to take away privileges and make everything even, so you have all mm. to go through the same things to to reach this three percent. Basically, what we have now is one percent or ten percent of people. Oh, okay. Uh, that live good, right? And that's the same. Everything else is kind of a slum. And there's like this one paradise and it's only 3% of all the people that will be able to live there. Mm -hmm. And until you're 18, you're all going to live on the same place and then you can go and take this test one time in your life. So you have one chance in your whole life. Mm -hmm. And what's the test about? Uh, it's... You've seen it too? No. <laughs> no the, Claudia, right? I, I watch it. Yeah. Huh? Maybe you need to check because there are many different texts and they're trying to check different abilities, intelligence, or kind of yeah. They try to seize the abilities that would fit the society best. So ah. it's the, the, the moral, but also the thinking, the logic thinking, uh, teamwork, um, all these kind of things that, well, you would actually, if you have all of these on a high level, you would also be good in the current business world. Hmm. Um, and of course, they say they make it even for everyone. But then you have, for example, people that cannot walk that good and they still have to go to the same test. So then it makes you doubt again, what about the privileges and is this like the right way to go? Hmm. And also people have more have a better education and get better prepared for this test than others so again yes the intention is there but then the execution is not so good yet and i think it's the same in our real life yeah it's the it's the meritism of, of capitalism that it's in do we say a wicked game wicked it's like trumpet <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I, I was saying wicked we, we is como con trampas, no? En plan como con Celia. Tricks, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, okay. Um, well, that, that doesn't matter. I was just saying that it's it's a little bit like capitalism. In fact, they they sell you these this discourse about equality of opportunities and, and meritism and um, if everybody, if people is, uh, if they have the, the capacities and, and they um, work hard, they will go um, to, to the top. And in fact, you look at the statistics and, and it's not right. It's not right. You have um, immense more possibilities of, of staying in poverty if you're born in poverty uh, than, than to go to the top. And uh, here we came to the point where we would like to combine what we discussed before, human rights and privileges. Are human rights a privilege? I, I can actually start. I personally yeah. think that it should not be like there are a privilege, that they are. Because technically, if you, the idea of human rights is something that every human being should have just because of the, uh, because it has been born as a human. And I think it's not like that. So thinking that someone has something that others doesn't have becomes a privilege. That is my opinion. That kind of reason, intention of 
making human rights was was very bright idea of that everybody is equal, everybody born the same. But in the end, this is kind of flipped over and turned into privilege by some historical mm. Mm, historical events. If we are talking specifically now about our travel and what we saw there, it was the effect of colonialism that yes. happened that happened some time ago, and people now have the effect of that, and they are less privileged than us. Yeah, and the other thing is that it's really difficult to not judge but to to describe it because we just have a small perspective of a world and a culture that is not ours. So I was thinking I would like to bring examples of these countries that we have passed by, but in the other hand, I don't see that I have the, the really right of doing it because it's not my culture. I'm not, I'm not that used to, and I don't know that much to really bring those examples. Just to, to answer your questions, um, just what you said, yeah, at the moment human rights definitely are privileges. They shouldn't be. And I think also what you said, where it came from, and I think this is the circle and the crazy thing, um, because the stage we have now is because back then, someone didn't respect human rights and they didn't even think in that way of human rights. So that's why we had colonism and why they exploited everything, right? And then dealing with these consequences today, is also very often why people protest and they try to, to fight this, right? It's still why sometimes people with a different color of skin receive a different treatment, although they shouldn't, because it still goes back to when we took the freedom away from other people and made them slaves. Um, and there's a lot of other things that go there through. So everything we now, I think, and that's what I believe, should be focused on evening this out. Of course, it's a very idealistic way because most probably won't happen that fast, if ever. Um, but that's also why I think if you have the privileges to education, if you have the privilege to unlock your potential and do something with it, then do it. Stop sitting on the couch 10 hours a day and just watching Netflix. I love to do that too, definitely. I mean, you heard how many series I know. <laughs> it's just the eyes. But definitely um, spend 10 hours sitting there. No. <laughs> but that's still, that's why I think if you have the privilege and you have the skills, then you should use it to try and work towards the bigger goal, which for me is to have a harmonic life with nature and society and the environment. Unfortunately, what happens very often at the moment is people using these elbow techniques. So they use the, their privileges only to achieve their goals, but they don't look further what lies behind it. And if we don't start doing this, all of us, then we're just going to have even a bigger miss, um, how do you say that, difference in rich and poor people and privileges and unprivileged mm -hmm. instead of solving the issues we have today. Um, I agree with the with your concept of responsibility. Uh, I think uh, effectively um, every human being and mostly the, the most privileged one should have the responsibility of making a better world and more even world. Um, and even if I think in, in a historical perspective, it is more common than the 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 reduction of inequalities. Uh, um, used to be because um, the, the struggles of poor people and oppressed people more than because of the responsibility of, of rich and poor people. But effectively, it's obvious that everybody has should have this responsibility. And uh, when we talk about human rights, and in fact, I think uh, in an historical perspective, human rights are not intended to be universal. I, I'm thinking basically on the and French Declaration of, of Human uh, Human Rights of the and the and civil civil rights. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what was the name, but yeah, the on the French Revolution, there's a declaration, the uh, Constitution de Droit de l'Homme des Citoyens, I think, um, and which is the most I think similar um, text 
to, to human rights today, apart from the 1945 declaration. And it is not intended to, um, to be universal and to be human, in fact. Uh, in fact, I think Pauline Gurs in the, in the same year, I think was Olympia Gurs, um, wrote the um, Declaration of Female Rights. And it is condemned to death, I think, because of this. Because human rights were not female rights, they were man rights. And they were probably not human rights, they were white people rights, bourgeois um, rights. So there is a constant and historic struggle to, to expand that concept of, of rights. And you, you talked it at the beginning of species, uh, of species and, and animalism. And I think, in fact, the, the animalism uh, um, movement is just struggling to, to expand this conception of, of human rights or natural rights to other species or, on the planet. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that ecologist movement expands the, the concept towards the, the conception of a natural right, of a, of a earth right and sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I would point that constant struggle to, to amplify, to expand, and to, and to enforce um, them. And I don't know what else I was saying. Okay, yeah, about the question of uh, if privileges are or they are not um, human rights. Uh, if I stick to my definition, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be because there are comparative advantages but there are no things that I shouldn't have. And this is because I made my definition thinking on that question. Um, trying to separate, um, difference the concept of privilege and the concept of, of human right. Mm, just um, because I think it's politically more useful to talk about human rights and about what everybody should have and fight for it than to talk about privilege. Mm, that when you talk about privilege, you think about something usually something you should not have and i think it will be more it is a more powerful idea to stick about what everybody should have and 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 the fight for for access to, to health care etc than the than talking about the privilege of of people that has um health care there, there was there are sometimes um discussions and, and struggles in the workers movements in spain between the more privileged workers, I would say, um, that has a, have a decent wage living, um, a strong unions, etc., and the less privileged workers that um, usually work on, on service, um, restoration, restaurants, etc., that has not uh, strong unions, not um, decent wages, etc. And sometimes in, in this struggle, it seems that the, the problem are the privileged workers. And not the problem, just the problem is the not privileged workers that should, um, and, and we all should fight for, for their rights. But we, we enter in a, in a discussion um, and it seems we should even the, the boss groups to the law, um, destroying the, the unions of the, of the most privileged workers, etc. So that's why uh, in these cases I prefer to, to not identify human rights and um, and privilege, even if it's uh, obviously uh, uh, there is a comparative um, benefit. I'm sorry for the. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and maybe now talking about responsibility, do you have any examples of people or organizations that are working defending human rights? I have one, but I forgot the name. Um, there's this girl. She was at the at the Youth to Youth International Summit last year in Hong Kong, and she's one of she's working for one of the organ. Uh, no, cut that. She's working <laughs> for the organization. <laughs> that actually helped to put in motion the women's walk. You know, this big, big walk where women then walked all over the, the earth um, to protest. I think it was 2018, the big ones. Um, so they definitely fight for, for human rights. Uh, and as I'm very much interested in social entrepreneurship, 
And that's also where I position my business. Basically, that's where I also met many people who on one way or the other fight for human rights. It might be they are activists or they running an organization or also um, they are journalists, like a female journalist, and she helped to achieve that in Egypt. They stop uh, mutilating, I think that's the word, um, young women. Mm-hmm. Because there was still an issue like a few years back. So, so some guys I know at the moment, um, it's no. They launched their first video, first music video called Mission to Earth. And they're basically, they also, in the video, you can see it was uh, filmed in South Africa. Um, and the first video was dedicated towards the topic of clean water for everyone. Mm-hmm. And Mission to Earth basically is what their whole mission is um, to help save the world and make it a better place again. And they include as well sustainability as well as everything that has to do with the humans. So you can definitely check them out. And uh, so going back to the question, Carlos, do you have an example? <laughs> um, well, I have examples about um, great uh, international NGOs uh, like uh, International Amnesty on more civil and political rights, um, on others based on uh, feminism, um, ecology, etc. In a more personal perspective, I was working some some years ago in a in an alternative food bank that uh, tried to empower people and, and in fact food banks used to um, take poor people give them food and and goodbye and the idea was to try to empower these people and make them part of the, of the organization and i don't know how is it working now because it was some years ago um, and and that's it and, Thank you. <laughs> so, Sergei, do you have something? Mm. Yesterday, uh, I found out a story of one pedagogue from Poland. It was time of Second World War. And this story is really like very strong for me. And I have alternative, which is nowadays kind of so. This Polish teacher. Uh, he was. Uh, he had his own orphanage. He started his career as a doctor. He was working with kids, and after he moved, he made his own orphanage, and he was taking care of Jewish uh, orphans during the Second World War. But it was him. He started before, and just like he was continuing his career in this way. And uh, in uh, 1942, like he. Uh, together with kids was kept in this uh, uh, gas camera and uh, at the moment but it's not about the death itself that he sacrificed himself but the most what he was doing for the kids like he was fighting for their rights and he was also one of the guys who actually wrote first uh, let's say call it's let's call declaration of kids right and now in Mauritania, we we met one guy who is an educator in a, in youth center, like his own youth center, and he's taking care of kids, also kind of orphaned. And he also, on the level of the country, on national level, he's fighting for their rights. And uh, yeah, this can be as a very empowering, uh, empowered empowering example, like at least that I witnessed in real life and I saw the result. Okay, so one more example, I just remembered, um, then I need to to, to go. Uh, so I have a friend and also he's also coaching, uh, living in Germany, but then after he traveled to India, he came back and he saw how the kids are living there. And he decided he needs to do something. 
so his solution was actually to go um, and build a school to enable them to also receive quality education. Mm -hmm. But he's not only teaching them about math and chemistry and all these kind of things, um, but additionally, and I think that's the more important part on how to live your right, uh, sorry, how to live your life the right way. So he's also enabling them and uh, to feel ready kind of to face life after school and giving them soft skills that they also will need no matter in what situation. And I think it's a really great example to say that you don't need to be a very famous or rich person. And basically, if you just have the will, you can just start anytime, anywhere. And that's also what I love about feeling empowered and yeah, having the freedom to talk and to think. So you just can go and you just start right now, right here. Okay. I think, uh, okay, you are leading to your feeling power. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have an example. I kept telling I had another one, but it's not that empowering. So I think I want to talk about the travel that I said that it was not going to bring examples, but I'm contradicting myself. So our de final destination was Guinea-Bissau and this sister school that we have there. And I think they are a clear example of fighting for human rights because they are not, they are there learning to be teachers and not to be waiting for the government to change the education, the education system there that is really not working at all. But they are there every day and they are really aspiring to them. Yeah. yeah uh... Here I have a question, which is, yeah, maybe not the best, but like for me, I think after this example, uh, the best way to fight for human rights, it's to create an opportunities to kind of maybe protect them or in, in your maybe case, like what you said, what your, uh, um, organization is doing this rabbit potential like it helps to uh, just like unleash potential yeah and you're creating an opportunity to unleash this potential which is maybe one of the ways how to protect human rights or fight for them or maybe give yeah let's say what I'm doing is more on a grassroots level and more indirect attached to human rights. Mm -hmm. So I know that I alone, I cannot change the world. It needs a million people to do this. And I also know where my strengths and my potential lies, right? I know that I'm not the best politician. So I'm not aiming to be the most famous politician. I know that I'm not the one who loves to lead a protest. So I won't start a protesting move or just being out there all the time and socializing all the time. But I do what I can best. And this is basically help people find their purpose, define it and also accompany them on the way to achieve this. And by that, I choose my people and my clients in a way that I know they also want to have an impact. So I work as a multiplicator, making sure that amongst them that I work with are the ones that then pass it on or also maybe themselves fight for human rights. And I think that's what everyone can do. Basically first define what are you really good at and what can you do with the privileges, the resources that you actually have. And it can be very small. You can start with five minutes a day, whatever it might be. That's the last point of our video call. Thank you very much yeah, for you very much. your participation, for your Michelle and for your Carlos. Muchas gracias. <laughs> De nada. Bye -bye. Well, thank you for the engagement and uh, the work you put in. And it's really... Hmm very interesting topics that you have not just this one but also the other ones so i'm curious to hear what you're going to bring next <laughs>